Welcome to Mac and Blue, the cutting edge podcast for the nation's builders, merging the realms of construction with exciting advancements in technology. Join us on a thrilling journey where we delve into the dynamic world of blockchain, AI, the metaverse, virtual and augmented reality, and their transformative impact on the industry. Our engaging discussions span a wide spectrum, covering not only construction, economic development, supply chain, and market segments, but also exploring the vibrant tapestry of diversity within the construction landscape. We shed light on the intersection of local politics and its profound influence on the construction sector while championing the remarkable contributions of women and minorities in construction. For all things Mac and Blue, head to www.macandblue.com and don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. I'm your host, JJ Levinsky. Now let's get into it. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Mac and Blue. I'm your host, JJ Levinsky, CEO and co-founder of Blue Wave. Uh, today I have Scott, Sar- Scott Carlson of Savvy Advisors on. I was lucky enough to meet Scott at a Venture Cafe That's event, right. downtown Phoenix, uh, we started geeking out. I think Herman Plank was around us That's and right. some other. Talked about metaverse. And oh yeah, we were, and we were geeking out, and so I'd ask Scott to come on. Um, a little bit of background, and then I'm going to tell why I want him on here because he's going to talk about anything from metaverse, cryptocurrency, blockchain, cyber attacks, basically how you're being held hostage, and he's going to get you out of jail for free. Wow. Um, now, in that though, other th- small world story is um, Scott also grew up in Minnesota, up in northern Minnesota, Thief River Falls, and the Moorhead area. Um, he went to a fine college up there as well. And I was in the Brainerd Lakes area for just under 15 years. So before we got on, we were talking hockey and snowmobiles and all the things that are uh, passionate up in that area. So uh, welcome, Scott. Thank for, you. Th- yeah. Thanks for being on. Appreciate it. Yeah. Later on this month, I will officially more than half my life in Arizona. So I'm not from here yeah. yet, but I'll always be from there. Yeah, and we always are. Yeah. Um, hey, just before we get in all the cool geeky stuff, yeah. um, normally I don't do a lot of resume building, uh, but if you could, because I think it's going to have tremendous relevance, uh, your resume is pretty damn cool. So yeah. can you just kind of talk about coming out of college, NSA, and then you work for some pretty damn important yeah, companies. Time. I've been pretty privileged. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you would just see. share and kind of tell a little bit of story about each one, because I think it really all will have relevance about when we get into the the new world or the present world. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been very lucky with, with my career and uh, to build the picture, I've been the math computer kid forever. My dad owned a Radio Shack. <laughs> he brought home all this stuff and I sat there and played adventure games and computer games <laughs> and was that kid who would, you know, reverse engineer computer games to cheat and get all the gold. You back. were war games. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I didn't, you know, attack okay. nuclear things or <laughs> I just wanted to get more gold in the game and beat it faster. Um, so sometime in college, um, my uh, stepbrother, he right. was a Navy officer oh. and he could sponsor somebody to go work at NSA as a co-op. And so basically he was like, hey, my, uh, my stepbrother here, he's probably pretty good at computer science and math. Why don't you consider him? And I went through the whole top secret clearance thing and they selected me to come out to work in field support and research and help them do first bits of internet encryption and some asynchronous switching. And I got to geek out for a little while in Fort Meade. Uh, Unfortunately, fortunately, I don't know, depending on how you want to measure that, they don't pay very well. Yeah. Uh, so I chose to come back to corporate America where I ended up at Cargill. So the largest conglomerate in the world, yep. it's not a bad place to work. And I got to travel around the U.S. building steel mills for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I got to go get all the suits up and put the hats on and try not to get burned by recycling mills and did that for a while. <laughs> and what role were you there? What? I was kind of like the server fixer guy. Okay. A, a lot of um, big iron and the um, L1 and L2 systems that run the machines that do rebar and pipe. Okay. Um, that all connects to a bunch of servers that has data and all that stuff. And so I supported the data the IMS side, it connected to a big mainframe at Cargill. So uh, I was back, the middle. And back guy. then, was there a, a lot of risk as a, as it compares to today's uh, in oh, today's no. age? It was okay. all disconnected from the world. Right, the only right. thing it connected to was Cargill, right? Okay. The so. risk was they can't roll pipe because they can't measure the little gadgets. Got it. But thankfully, as it comes with most manufacturing, even today, you can unplug the computers and still make it work because it's just a machine. Oh. Less so now with automation and assembly and robots and stuff, you know, it stops working. But back then it's still shot rebar out the end. Right. Um, so it was much better. You just had to stop it from breaking, <laughs> not being attacked. So that, that was good. Uh, at some point in what, 1998, I uh, followed the girl to Arizona. Okay. And uh, got a job at Charles Schwab. I was the Y2K boy for Charles oh. Schwab. There, you know, some big thing happened at the point that 
was an event, not an event, because we prepared a lot for it. And so anticlimactic in, yeah, in 2000. I, you know, I, I really do believe we worked really, really hard for a couple of years to make yeah. sure it wasn't a problem. Uh, there was a few little glitches, but stock mm. trading system still worked. And one of the things that I really like about being there I, is I had the privilege to fix some really interesting problems at the first company to launch online stock trading. And when you are the first to do anything, it, it just breaks all the time. And the the group of folks who was there with me and um, the, the teams, we, a lot of mainframe work, a lot of mid range. It was the first place that ever had 10,000 servers that I was at. And oh, wow. it, it was really fun to, to, to make data centers work with that kind of high availability um, environment. Um, after I left there, I was at University of Phoenix for a while, uh, you know, the online education for mm -hmm. adults. And we built and destroyed some data centers and moved some stuff around. And, you know, the goal was... <laughs> I love that. Built and destroyed. Yeah. You know, we had to get out of that building to move into that building. And yeah. you know how that works. You got to, okay, what do we take with us? What do we don't? Uh, so I had some data center stuff. And then I landed at PayPal. PayPal, uh, I think everybody knows who that is. You probably have a yeah. PayPal account. It is, I think, maybe still the most attacked company on the internet. Really? Because the like the only thing they do is help you send money. Right. Like who wouldn't want to attack that? And one of the big things there is. So were you in there early or no uh, oh, late? Late. So okay. What was I? Eleven. Two thousand eleven. Okay. So all the founders were gone. Okay. Um, it was kind of about ramping up production to how many payments per second can you handle? Um, it was just getting into POS. No tap and pay in the United States yet. Oh. Point of sale. Um, so person to person payments were just taking off in thirteen fourteen. So it was just like getting ready for the hockey stick, I guess you could say. A, a lot of data center, big data work, um, hyperscale compute, all those fun words. How do you make computers go really fast to handle financial payments entirely online? It, was, that, it had to be kind of cool, though. Oh, it's so cool. The, the great thing about a place like that is when you... Was us, it remote or were you with a team at the time? I was here in Scottsdale. Okay. Yeah, so I'd fly out to San Jose a couple of times a week generally to, to talk to the team there, headquartered out there, okay. big facility here in Scottsdale and Shea. And, uh, you know, we, we talked a lot about security and data centers and uh, CPUs and, you know, how to measure all this at, at the time there with eBay, PayPal separated from eBay in 14, I think. Okay. And so we had to create a whole public company and mm. do all the things kind of brand new at internet scale. And when you have people doing payments and when you have uh, the fact that people must have this work all the time. Mm -hmm. You have to keep it up while upgrading it, while migrating it. You don't get to take an outage for a weekend. Um, and and that's like that's a lot of fun when you are not only the most attacked place, but you have some of the smartest people in the world working there trying to figure out how to make it go faster. It's the whole analogy of changing the tires on the car while it's going on the freeway. Right. It's like that there. What was, what, just for the audience sake, what, I mean, you're obviously super intelligent yourself. But what is it really like working with that many brainiacs? Do you is like an, is it an exponential learning environment or d is it very competitive? Is it very compartmentalized? And what, what what's the kind of culture sometimes, like? Sometimes, I think if I were to look at, it, I was mostly with architects and strategists. Okay, right. A lot of the super crazy smart people have a better way to do things, okay. and and a lot of the effort is to control the ideas to the ones you can actually pull off in a reasonable amount of time. It, it takes a lot of brain power to change the world. It also takes a really long time to do some of the really crazy ideas. Mm. So the ones that are easy to implement that actually make a business difference are the ones that bubble to the top. Mm. And the business leaders for a while were really good about, you know, we know that we will transform payments if we can understand people's behavior. For, for instance, there's a phenomenon known as cart abandonment in, what is that? Uh, in online shopping. So yeah. I really like this shirt, click, put it in my cart. Oh, football game, something happened. And you forget about your cart forever. You never go back and make the purpose, the purchase. So how do you stop people from putting something in their cart and then never buying it? And you do that by studying all the data when did they click it? How long did they leave it there? What were they doing? How do you incent them to click pay? And that mm. is an insane amount of servers and data, yeah. you know, trillions and trillions of events per day. If people have heard of data lakes, data swamps, data process, like that's all, how do I know what you clicked and when you did it so that I can incent you to actually complete your purchase? Interesting. A and then make sure that it's not a bad guy who stole your account trying to buy something they shouldn't have bought. 
So like that stuff is when you think through that with the really smart people, um, not only do you have to accept that, yeah, if a nation state attacked, it would be really hard to fend them off. But when regular people are trying to do it, sometimes they make mistakes and mm. you have to be able to handle the customer service and the risk and the legality part. Because I think one of the other important things about environments like Schwab and like mm -hmm. PayPal is they're fully regulated legal in every state and jurisdiction and a bank everywhere. Makes sense, yeah. So you better comply because the goal is to do it right in a way that helps people, not to find some interesting way to avoid the law. That, that kind of puts hair on your chest, I guess, but yeah. it's also, you know, w when you talk to some of the smartest people, like I said before, there are no shortage of ideas. It's about how to pull it off and how to do the ones that actually matter now, of course, within time and budget. Because yeah, you have to monetize it at some point. Otherwise, Correct. these big corporations are not going to, hey, yeah, we got your think tank over there, but produce some revenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So after PayPal, I uh, made it to the sales side of the world. Oh. Um, business development, advise CEOs, here's what you buy to not get hacked. And I think for the last 10 years or so, besides a short stint as a CISO, I've been advising large and small companies how to do the things that are necessary to not get in trouble. Got it. Uh, some of it's like only give people the right privilege. Other things are what do I do to not um, have ransomware delete everything. It's really interesting when you think now this world of cybersecurity that I play in all the time, you absolutely have to trust the people you work with to do their job. That, that's kind of the point of them working with you. But you absolutely can't trust them to do everything without supervision on a highly complicated computer system. So there's a technology bit, which is I better make sure it's actually them doing this thing. So is it versus let them do whatever they want? Or is it just like the old saying, trust but verify? Totally. Okay. And of course, this is not a supervised because you don't trust them. And that's right. where the emotional bit of this comes in. And a lot of this is a communication problem where like, of, of course, you're the financial administrator and you have the password to the bank account. But how about we just have more than one person approve if you're going to send $50,000? Yeah. Like, that seems like a good Checks idea, Checks and balances, right? right, yeah. Yeah, and so most of uh, computer security today, you have to accept that the bad guy is much smarter than you, first mm -hmm. of all, and you have to limit the blast radius. Mm -hmm. So make sure people have the least amount to do their job. Make sure that if it's really important, you have a, a lot of people looking at it, and then be able to react. And that's the thing I think people don't emphasize enough in this world, and that I've learned my whole career, um, probably more than anything, is the concept of crisis management. You should practice what you would do when something bad happens. We teach our kids this. How do we cross the street? What do we do if somebody gets hurt? You know, what, when do we do this and that and the other thing? That is the same in business. Who are you gonna call when something bad happens. Oh, we don't know, we would just find the guy. That's not the right answer. Build a checklist, I don't care if, what it is. You need to know who to call, what to do, and you need to be able to do it without panic in a time of crisis, whatever that crisis is. And a, a lot of this today, when everything is on the internet, the thing that people don't realize is it takes a year to build your business. It takes about nine seconds for the bad guy to delete your whole business. At like for real nine seconds. Right. This is not like after a couple of weeks, you yeah. do, no, it's gone. Right. And that's a shock to a lot of people because of this whole trust factor. So this is a hard conversation for people to have um, as they, as we talk through their environment and right. they tell me what they do and you know even what you have, think about all the ways you trust your most trusted confidants to just oh. go do your business stuff. And now turn around and say, what if that went wrong? What would I do? Right. It, sometimes you say, oh, I will never go wrong. I, I trust Steve to do his <laughs> job, right? Because that's what you say. But what would you do if it went bad? However it went bad, what would you yeah. do? It's, it's hard to know what you would do, and that's, that's tricky. And I, I think I've been privileged enough to work at some of the best, most stringent companies in the world. And this this bit that I do now, this, this Scott as a service, I call it, Savvy yeah. Advisors, is, is kind of about... Let's have a conversation. Let's l actually learn from our mistakes of the past and apply it to what your business is. Because everybody's got to do this stuff in their way. And that I think is, 
that's my message of today. Everybody's got to do this stuff. I do, I do have to interrupt you because I love it. The For all of you in the audience, the SAS. Everyone yeah. knows what a SAS is. But Scott, to his credit, has, has turned that into Scott as a service. <laughs> I got to give you credit. That's pretty pretty ingenious. Unfortunately, the the Google algorithm that matches SAAS doesn't land on me very often. <laughs> I can't understand why. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Hey, um, let's take just a time out and a tangent because the what you do, the spaces that you work in, I, let's ground the audience first because yeah. the media is all over the board on what really ransomware, cyber attacks, Russia, China, you know, Nigeria, whatever, all these, these things. You play in this space so much. Can you condense it down into like a re, uh, into a bit Reader's Digest version of what's really happening out there in the world with the bad guys? Just to give a, a context yeah. of how we go into the, some of these other conversations, Scott. Yeah. So there's probably a couple of patterns that you okay. see that you see come out. Number one, um, you have something that is valuable to you. It's either money, intellectual property, or people's data. Right. Um, because it's important to you and it has value the bad guy thinks they can monetize that. Got it. They monetize that by not asking, by taking. They either delete it, they encrypt it and ask you for money for the key. Hence the ransom. Or they hold it hostage. Like that's generally the pattern. Got it. Um, or, or they steal it so they can sell it to somebody else, right? Some data we have is useful to your competitors or the bad guys, or for instance, if they steal your credit card, they can go sell it to somebody for like, eight dollars and that person can use your credit card and buy something got it eight dollars blah 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 whatever but if they steal a million of them times eight dollars suddenly it's money right but what the bad guys are trying to do is get to your data so that they can monetize it in some way they usually do that by uh messing with human beings socially engineering if you talk talk for a person into something just happened to mgm uh probably happens to CFOs all the time or secretaries. Probably people have seen the gift card scam lately. I don't know if your no, own elaborate. company has been this, which is, hey, I need to uh, reward my employees for a job well done this week. Can, can you run out to you know, the grocery store and buy a bunch of $25 gift cards? Okay. And usually the person who gets this says, oh, of course, because it'll fake coming from you. So right. maybe your admin will run out and uh, get a bunch of these e-gift cards. And then the next text will say, great, thank you, send them to this address so I can distribute them. And that's where the fraudster gets that's, the money. Okay. And so it's a standard kind of bait and switch engineering thing, but th that is how the bad guys are getting in today. They, they generally socially engineer the person or they guess your password because it's been broken into, or they just break into the computers. One thing that everybody probably has had to do is upgrade their Windows somewhere in their life or their iPhone, <laughs> click here to do the software update, and everybody hates it. But the reason that we do that is because somebody has found a way to break in. Right. You would never leave your front door unlocked. You would actually close the lock. We are bad at doing that with computer systems because mm. it's hard and most people don't know what's happening when they click the button because it probably doesn't act the same when they're done and they get mad at it, so they don't do it. But if you don't do it, the bad guy can break in that way. And so to simplify it down, I've rambled a lot for a minute here. Is no, no, you're... It's... They have data, you have data that they want. They will try to access it by a human means or an attack through a system mean so that they can monetize it. That's all it boils down to. We have so many sanctions on these countries that you mentioned. They have to get it through illicit means. And when you can steal data in this place called the dark web where it's kind of anonymous transactions, yeah. That's how they that's how they get their money to do more bad things. It's kind of the the new way of the drug lord war, or, you know, the information war, anything like that. There comes a time when dreams become a reality. When you see your vision materialize into a true work of art. And the only way to get there is to choose a general contractor who shares that same vision and knows how to bring it to life. At Blue Wave, we aren't so big that we've forgotten where we've come from. And we aren't so small that we can't care for your projects regardless of their size. When your vision deserves safety, perfection, timeliness, and expertise in order to become a reality, trust Blue Wave to get it done right the first time.
So again, educate the audience of, like let's use Phoenix for example, yep. the expansion of data centers and these massive data centers around the, the world, the globe, whatever. What, for the layperson, what does that look like? What does it mean? And how much of what you are doing is in those in in those data centers for again for the average person? Yeah. So let's see. Let's first let's think about why there's data centers in yeah. Phoenix because that's going. interesting. So yeah. Phoenix and Las Vegas are two of the places in the world that have all the important things for a data center. Okay. The climate is good, so the humidity is low. Yeah. There's multiple power grids, SRP and APS. There's very few natural disasters, no tornadoes, no typhoons, no hurricanes. It's just hot. It's a good, it's just hot, but it cools off at night. Yeah. So you can open the windows and as long as you, you kind of generally need to pipe some mist in to keep it a little bit humid, it's a really good place to run things that run hot. Okay. You just can't let them burn up. And so, you know, Phoenix, as well as outside of Vegas are a couple of best places in the world to build a data center the uh all of the major providers have started to put stuff here uh, because we have realized that having multiple copies of data for disaster recovery reasons is really important we need the compute near people because of speed of light it takes a long time to get things around the world but also we don't want it to break okay and so we put it all these data centers in phoenix the thing that you get with this data center is you you get a place to put information but what may or may not run here is the front end that people interface with. Like you go to amazon.com, that's a website, Yeah. right? It may or may not run in Phoenix, but the images might be in Phoenix or like a copy of your Google drive on google.com might be in Phoenix, but google.com might not be like that makes, is an example. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't yeah. know if those actually are here, but as an example, and when people attack information, they don't go to the data center. Got it. There, there are stringent data center rules, tier four, it's got kind of cool acronyms, as you know. Um, they have security guards, some of them have, you know, proper weaponry <laughs> and fences and cameras. I mean, just think of what you envisioned Fort Knox to be. Yeah. Tier four data centers are like that. Like you need an army to get through the door. So you don't attack the data center. You call the guy at the desk and say, hey, I lost my key. And that's why you go to the company and you go to the users of the facility. You never break into the facility anymore. So it's really great that Phoenix has these because not only has it brought a lot of tech jobs, but it's bringing a lot of the data here, which now maybe can bring the data expertise because people are close to the data. Oh. But it's also going to maybe raise the risk posture of the tech support and the administrative staff who are local because they're going to try to be, you know, finagled to go do something they shouldn't. Or didn't mean to you know the the fun thing about information security is because well if you believe this humans try to do the best thing they try to do the right thing and they're very willing to help and if you sound like you need help people are like oh i'm glad to help you but if it's a bad guy you're helping yeah. whoops you did a really great thing for the wrong person thank, thank you for that explanation because i think a lot of people don't realize i I learned something now. Um, I had heard a different uh, philosophy on the data centers, but it makes a lot of sense of oh, when you describe that. So thank you for sh yeah. sharing that. Uh, let's switch gears and go a little bit more into uh, metaverse, crypto, and, sure. and blockchain. Um, I really don't have any specific questions because it's just it's a never-ending topic. <laughs> but it seems like as fast as – maybe we'll go down this one – as fast as – as NFTs came up, it seems like, yeah. and the crypto, it seems like that whole noise kind of quieted down a little bit. And be interested on in your perspective of of uh, kind of the why of that through your lens. Yeah, I think we probably need to explain what some of these words are okay, before ahead. we go there. Go but um, if uh, people have probably heard what a blockchain is and right. they've heard of Bitcoin and stuff, but you know, when you think about maybe a better way to do certain tasks automating them with computers is generally a pretty good way to do it. Um, if you try to, for instance, automate a supply chain, and this is one that's pretty easy to understand, you can either send a piece of paper with every truck, every place they go, and then when that's delivered, you pay him in 30 days, and then they pay somebody else in 60 days, and you know, pretty soon it takes a year to move a pallet from Phoenix to Scottsdale, right? It's silly. Right. So why not put that all in computers? 
why not use some kind of value counter that sees who gets what out of the transaction. And when the truck shows up, you just pay everybody what they get. Right. Like that seems pretty neat, but it's complicated when you remove the humans from this conversation. <laughs> you have a bunch of really complicated math and algorithms and computer systems and things that we call tokens. And it's just kind of keep track along the way. So a blockchain is our attempt at making this kind of thing automated. It keeps track of the transaction. It agrees that it happened. It has counters called tokens and it has the ability to represent an object as a token. For instance, if I uh, have a pallet, how about we call it number one and we call the token number one and we say it's that pallet. Okay. Uh, maybe we call it that painting behind your head, yeah. painting number one. Well, how do I know it's painting number one? Well, it's because it's got a serial number in the corner and I put a picture of the painting with it. Great, so now I can look and see that it's a token of a painting, but you know what? I don't wanna delete that painting, like it exists. So I'm gonna make it non-deletable. So now I have a non-deletable token that's on this truck and our magic supply chain. And people like the idea that, huh, I have a non-deletable digital thing that I can move around and transact with. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And I can put it in my place that I store things. How about we call that a wallet? Because people like the word wallet. So now I have a picture of your painting in my wallet. That's kind of cool. It's it's useful because now I can transact that painting without moving it. Mm -hmm. We are, like I said before, inventing this stuff for the very first time. So people are trying to find cool new ways to do stuff. And the first things that people generally do with it is art, provocative materials, games, and the first doves generally are worth the most of anything. This is the first signed ball. This is the first baseball card. This is the first token of a painting. And these um, things called NFTs um, that um, piqued human beings interest. Like mm. it was the first thing a consumer could see. You can't see a blockchain. It's just a bunch of complicated computer nonsense. You can see a picture of a digital painting and when suddenly a hundred people want it and there's only one, the value goes up. The thing that happened though, if people are tracking this industry is there wasn't anything to do with it yet. Once you own it, it's just there, there on your phone. Look, see, I own this. And so the, the interest dropped because there wasn't something to do with these digital paintings yet. But what we learned as a technologist, we learned what doesn't doesn't work. We learned how to make it more impervious to attacks. Ah. We learned how to secure the key that makes these tokens. We learned how to move it around the world in a couple of seconds. We learned how to do a million transactions a second. We learned how to do one a minute. Like we learned so much about the math and computer bits <laughs> by human beings throwing money at it okay. that we now can build systems that will work in the real world when real people actually transact. And, and I use this silly test, you know, I call it, is this stuff grandma proof? Like if you said um, today, right now, what is it, 2023? I'm gonna give my grandma her digital copy of her deed to her house, and I'm gonna put it on her phone in her wallet. Now, what did she do with this? Like, can she, can she, does she do anything with it? Like, can she go to the bank and get a loan? No. No. What if she drops her phone in the lake? Like, is her house gone? Is it like, is there needs to be more than one? How do, like, what do we even do when human beings get a hold of this stuff? That's what we're still working out. And so this whole burst around, can we use it as art? M maybe, but there's not a really good use case for it yet other than we could do it. Can we okay. use it in games? Maybe in Roblox and Minecraft and things when you finally earn the super awesome sword, you get to keep the super awesome sword even if Minecraft goes out of business. Okay. Maybe you, uh, people who, have spent a hundred bucks on so their kids get all these drops and Xbox and yada, yada, yada. I think everybody knows that if they stop supporting that game, all your stuff's gone. It's not yours, it's in that game that they're supporting. Maybe if it's a digital thing and you have it in your wallet, it's yours. And the fact that something can be yours in the digital world could have some pretty interesting use cases because I could sell you a car in five seconds, not four hours. I could do a title search once, 
not every time I transact a house. I could sign a lease document, not with DocuSign, but with something where I just transfer ownership around. Things could literally take five seconds and be legal rather than us deal with all the archaic paperwork of the past. Right. But the thing is, if I don't work every kink out, nobody will trust it. And the thing with these systems, come on, nobody trusts digital systems. Okay, a lot of people trust digital systems, but then there's but always the, ah, oh, the information's wrong. Right, but they did it for play, not for real. Correct. You know, if you think about, does the title to my house need to be real and accurate and permanent? Yes. How do I do that? I record it at the county recorder. What if I put it on some magic internet system in the sky? How do I trust that? That's a really, really, really hard question for a lot of people. How do I trust a 100% digital thing to do the right thing 100% of the time? Mm -hmm. That's what we've been working out in the blockchain land. So let me ask you some questions then, Scott, as a, as a self-described technologist, then, it, okay, we saw the spike, the, yep. the recreational the spike, and then we spike. saw, I would consider myself one of those people, that's kind of how I met you. We said, all right, there's commercial applications here. Yep. Um, and then we, we, we hit glass ceilings called government regulatory things. That's right. Um, we have great ideas, we can't get it to, to, to market. Um, so where where in that sine wave are we? Are we have we flatlined where where your world is now working through those kinks? Is it is it you know like is it five years now before we can get the the commercial application of these of these you know call it we had the beta now the next the next yeah, yeah I guess wait alpha we production yeah yeah you know yeah. it's like and I'm not looking for a magic answer I think the audience would be really interested in your perspective of um like let's let's go to the let's go to the title one that's yeah. an easy one real estate's an easy one okay scott in your best estimation when could when could that be done on blockchain Le you know it is already legal to that in arizona it I is believe. legal okay so uh, the how about well, practical let's go that uh, well you um first you have to break apart what this means to be legal right like you have to sign it which means you need a digital signature. Right. You need to attribute the digital signature to a human. You have to verify who the human is. Okay, can you do that on a blockchain? No, no. I don't know who you're you unless you go look at somebody. Good point. Or you have some digital biometric thing, like we haven't solved the who are you yet. So that's, there's the that's human a bit. That's a very good point. But there's a contract which has to be written digitally yep. to signers. And then after you agree that they signed the contract, all of which is digital, then you have to record it digitally in the place that has the permanent record. So there's like five or six steps in here. Yeah. Uh, a bunch of years ago, they made it legal to uh, use a digital signature to enforce a contract in Arizona. That was one of the big things. Right. Then they made it legal to um, submit a deed digitally, but they didn't work out the part where you can store it digitally forever. Like they still use fax and they still have to record it with a recorder like stamp because that human QC at the end is still the thing that catches the whoops. Um, so is it legal to? Absolutely. Do we still not trust it? Yes. yes. For very good reasons. Right. Um, so in, in Arizona, we, I think we're one of the first three states in 2017 to allow a blockchain sandbox, which means I could use these tokens to loan people a little bit of money okay. and have it be legal. I could allow them to sign a contract and have it be legal. I could uh, pay people their salary and have it be recognized as money. I can allow that digital thing to then pay taxes. And so we allowed within certain use cases yeah. for small companies to innovate without getting sued. And if you look at where we are today, is it okay to do a bunch of business processes all digitally on a blockchain? Probably it's okay. It's probably legal in most places. Is it legal to have somebody sign something with their blockchain digital signature? That's more iffy, purely because it's hard to irrefutably prove who this human being is. It's called agency in the legal world. Yeah. What agency are you signing? You own a business or, or a bunch, you know, Married, single, do you have kids? Are you signing as the dad of your kid or the CEO of your company? Like which key do you pick in your digital vault right then? 
yeah. because it matters. It legally matters who you signed it as. So like that stuff we haven't worked out. And the thing that people argue about the most right now is, is it money? If I send you a Scott coin, mm. I could go on my phone and I could make a Scott coin and I could send you a million of them. Is it money? Not according to the government, it's not. Maybe you agreed that you would send me some of your coin for my coin and we decide it's a transaction value, but it's not money. And when we look at what the US government is doing right now, specifically around, was it really a stock that you made called a token? <laughs> yeah. Did you think it would go up in value and that's why you bought it? Or is it just you needed something to count to 50 and you agreed to automate this with a counter that goes to 50? Goodness. Those use cases are generally fine. You know, you pay your electric bill because it counted to 200, whatever. But if I think this is money and I give you a Bitcoin, is a Bitcoin money or is it a collectible or is it a thing or is it a property? Is it a baseball card? We haven't figured that out yet. And right. that's what we're fighting about the most is the monetary implementation, not whether it's okay to use technology advancements to make life better. I think people are like, hey, this is useful. We would like to pay people faster. You better use a dollar, not a Bitcoin. Like we change the conversation when it gets to money and taxation and important things. I think you did a great job of explaining that. So thank you. <laughs> there comes a time when dreams become a reality. When you see your vision materialize into a true work of art. And the only way to get there is to choose a general contractor who shares that same vision and knows how to bring it to life. At Blue Wave, we aren't so big that we've forgotten where we've come from. And we aren't so small that we can't care for your projects regardless of their size. When your vision deserves safety, perfection, timeliness, and expertise in order to become a reality, trust Blue Wave to get it done right the first time. You could, it's, it's nice because you, you you play in that space so you can you can make make it very um, pragmatic for the yeah. listeners to understand. So thank you. Um, of course, the other topic everyone wants to talk about is AI. Yeah. So come on, put your give me your your geek turned prag, pragmatic guy here. Talk to the talk to the world and the audience about AI. Of what's been good, where are the challenges, what do you see coming. Um, applications both good and bad i mean i could go on and on and on yeah i think it's so useful um with its implementation today okay so there's again this is a, a definition thing right so um when you look at what we call ai artificial intelligence it's not that at all it's actually uh, scientific computer science generally called machine learning machine learning yeah. it's a lot of patterns written on a lot of data that has determined that you know certain things happen more often. It's, it's just a big computer science problem. And I don't mean to you know, little, yeah. belittle the, yeah. the wicked smart people who are making this work, but everybody probably has used Google. Yeah. And you're like, uh, how do I change a tire? And it recommends 17 articles that are like, when I was a boy, my dad used to, to and like, there's this huge thing and it doesn't say go find the lug lug nuts and the wrench, right? That's all you want to know. So why shouldn't you be able to ask a computer, just give me the four steps to change a tire and have it spit it out? Or as we get further along, I have a bump on my skin, should I go to the doctor? And have it give you a real answer based on medical data. Mm -hmm. Or things like, how do I solve this thing in the game? You know, before we would go to the library, we'd check out the book, we'd read through it, we'd find the steps, we would learn how to do it. Da, 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 da. Why can't we use the knowledge of humankind to ask a question and get an answer? Because right. it helps us go quicker. A lot of what this machine learning AI is solving today is it's allowing humans to be better at what humans are better at, which is doing the complex thing where you have to use your hands you shouldn't need to retain all this arcane technical bits of how to do something. You need to be the doer. And often, as we've seen in some of the banking apps and such, like, I just need to know where the nearest ATM is. 
hey, Siri, where's the nearest ATM? And it says, I've Googled this for you. Would you like to see a map on your phone? No, just tell me where it is. Yeah. Like you need an AI to just be like, it's on 32nd in Indian school. It'll take you six minutes to get there. 500 feet to your Because that's what yeah. you want. Yeah. You want the succinct based on all this stuff answer. And that's what we're starting to see. Yeah. It's starting to give you real answers to this. And I was joking with my cousin this morning. Um, he was taking stuff from a Word doc and putting it in the right fields of a spreadsheet for some questionnaire he was doing. And like, you should be like, hey, computer thing, like go take the words and put it where you think the right place is and I'll quality check it when you're done. Like that's not something humans should get good at copying and pasting. Yeah. A computer should move stuff around and we should then see if it makes sense. And so a lot of this AI stuff, which um, is LLM, the large language models and things called transformers, all these technical words, mm -hmm. it basically is, uh, what is the general order of things in the English language? What is the common answer that we've seen in all the literature from the experts? And do we just regurgitate that? I use this a lot um, when I do some computer work now because I don't remember how to reboot version seven of a weird thing on a certain type of server. So I <laughs> the type- The Commodore 64. Yeah, right? And it, Sean like- Sean used to got one of those, right? <laughs> man, I could go find the manual and I could look it up or I could, hey, who you sell the man? Or I could say, how do I reboot a Commodore 64? And it'll say, bing, 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 bing. It'll just tell me. Yeah. And you know what, if I need to do it, why don't I just say, go do that? Yeah. Because not everybody types fast, so why not? So like, this is really interesting. The, uh, the other bit that's more provocative is the art. Do we let it generate art? Can AI generate a Picasso now? It can make it look like it's a Picasso. It can, yeah. Is it actually Picasso? No, no, no. no. And the, the legal people have just recently stated that if an image is generated by an AI, aka a computer, you cannot copyright it. Um, so if a human does something, it's copyrightable. If a computer does it, it's not copyrightable. It's art, I think, under a certain circumstance. Um, so that's interesting that the ability to come up with logos and art and pictures like your, the one behind your head is kind of crazy right now. Yeah. A computer can generate 100 million of those in the time it took that artist to do one. Amazing. And it might be useful, right? Um, the voice and the avatars and... You know, with, I, I think it's like, with 30 minutes of video and audio from anybody, you can create an avatar that speaks and sounds exactly like them now. Oh, it doesn't surprise me And at you all. can make anybody be anything and say anything you want. That is interesting. I'm not gonna say scary. I'm gonna say interesting because that matters when human beings react emotionally to what they hear. You could make, if, if you could make any world leader say anything you want them to say and get the video watched by enough people, suddenly humans would react emotionally to that. That could have some really negative outcomes. Yeah. Like I couched that really carefully there. But no, no, no. Like, I, and you don't have to be PC on this show. No, but like even uh, something just happened recently where there apparently is a piece of software floating around that if I called you on the phone, I would sound like your mother because I found some audio of her because right. she was a newscaster or whatever. I could say, and be like, hey, can you please send me $500? I just got a new bank account, I'm buying a car. And you'd be like, sure, mom. Yeah. It's not like you would call her back. I just spoof her phone number. I use my AI voice changer and I tell you to send me money. And you would because you trust the voice. If I can make the voice be anything I want, what do you do? How do we act as humans? The reason it's scary is because we haven't figured out how to handle it yet. Right. This is why it's scary. We're it, we're scared because we don't know what to do. Well, think of the world events right now too. If someone could, and let's use let's use really bad things to prove relevance. Let's say I'm, you know, I can I can spoof my way into being the North Korean dictator. Abs absolutely. And I call for action of. 500,000 people to take up arms and go invade South Korea. They're going to believe it, you know? And so, yeah. or take the recent events in the Middle East, you know? Mm -hmm. some Somebody could perceive leader, do this, and yeah. go, hey, um, I want everyone to, you know, march for me, Cairo over to 
Israel and wipe them out or something yeah, like that. Yeah, you know, pick pick Phoenix here, pick anywhere, and pick any political figure that's a little bit divisive. I don't care yeah. who it is. Agreed. Make them say something provocative for 30 seconds. Put it on YouTube, TikTok, X, and Facebook. It will get shared by a few thousand people, but then the algorithms will click in, in and people will be like, can you believe so-and-so said that? Yeah. And it would go viral in an hour. And there are some people who would react. And if if that thing that the leader said, like you said, the North Korea thing, if it was, you know, I, I think Pizzagate, people might remember Pizzagate. Yeah. You know, there's something bad happening in the basement of the pizza place. People went over there with guns to confront that person. <laughs> That's what happens. Like something bad physically happens because of this information. And I think when we start thinking about, is this okay to use generated information with generated outcomes with an avatar I can make say anything I want that can look however I want and I can do that all automatically at the push of a button. We don't know how to confront that that's happening. True. So we naturally want to stop it from happening and we try to ban it. A, a ton of computer people and now there's tens of thousands of us trying to figure out how do I do this safely? Because it sure would be nice to go to the airport and walk up to the little digital thing and be like, can you tell me where my flight is? Oh, welcome to the airport, Scott. You've yeah. been here before. It's right over there at gate seven. That would be amazing. But there's a lot of work yeah. between that and what we're seeing today. Um, so this AI thing is is really, really cool. It will really change how we search. It will change how we get our information. It's going to change how our kids learn. The Khan Academy would, guy is on to this with learning. Oh, I was great. just going to ask. Look, look at it. I wrote it down. I'm like, <laughs> the biggest thing was, okay. And I don't mean to bash our educational system, but we need to bash it. With AI, if we're just going to regurgitate information as right. uh, we have to start teaching our kids how to learn, not regurgitation of information. AI is just it, what little is already out there. It can just do all that in a fraction of the second. So I am yeah. curious, what do what does your peer group talk about? Um, let's use Khan Academy. What, what are some what are some new and innovative things, or what's what's out there as far as how we're going to transform the educational system? Not because of AI, but in light of AI. Yeah, the the I think the big one that really excites me, and there's one is, when we look at your average school, that one set of teachers has to teach a set of things to everybody at the same time. Okay. What AI and um, individual computer systems that you can interact with allows you to do is create individual learning programs that adapt to how that person is needs to learn. Are you visual? Fine. I'm gonna generate images on the fly to show you what happened during Brilliant. that war. Do you need to hear it? Fine, I will have James Earl Jones talk you through the Titanic or, story. Or give it in three you languages. You wanna read it? Yeah. And yeah, you need it in Spanish or Arabic or whatever? Okay, it'll spit out in one second. Um, individual learning allows you to adapt to the needs of everybody. It, it's the great cancellation thing of, sorry, you can't pay attention in class. Okay, you're gonna have the AI teacher who helps you through this now because it will go at your pace. So these poor teachers that have struggled with all these IEPs, th this is the equalizer. It could help that yeah. under many circumstances yeah. and educators turn into information organizers, not necessarily the presenters. True. Um, my own daughter had a, an incident or an example of this. Um, she's on some advanced math thing and she was doing some Imagine topic. Imagine that. She has your genes. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't, whatever it was, she didn't understand what the teacher tried to explain. This is how you do this thing. And she's like, I just, I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. So I pasted it into ChatGPT and I said, explain this to her like you're a math teacher explaining what the concepts are. And it went, shh, shh, shh. and she read it and she's like, oh. I totally get it now. And she went off and Isn't did that it. Yeah. yeah, and so the the ability to say, I don't understand yet, re-explain it in a different way is what's gonna change education. Yeah. All, I have four kids, all of my kids learn in a different way. One learns by reading, one learns by watching, one learns by drawing, like they all needed different strong characteristics of the teachers. They learned really well in the Phoenix education system, uh, but it helps them even more if they can just answer that one question. Um, just watching the time, I want to be uh, 
<laughs> we could we talk for hours. <laughs> Again, because of your unique perspective, Scott, talk a little bit about, let's take AI as it interacts. Okay, and I, I, I'm really glad you talked about machine learning versus artificial yeah. intelligence. I think it's imperative that people understand that. With that though, Again, in your world, in your, in your fraternity, sorority of, of smart people and what you guys do is help explain to the audience the interaction between that and then application. I'm thinking of the future of ro the current and future state of robotics or whatever. Yeah. What have you guys seen there and what can you like, explain to the, the audience about what that, how that may trans, like pick an industry that you might know intimately and say, this is how that's going to change three years from now as it relates to AI to end product or end service with robotics. Sure. I, I think if we look at this whole industrial revolution, right? Okay. We, we learned how to make a car. Okay. How do I make a car? I do the same things a lot of times. There's a lot of information tasks that are the same thing every time. Yep. Um, the, medical's the easiest one, but um, we'll there, there. there yeah. are certain, or law, actually law is good because okay. there's a ton of law books and what's in the law text is the law. So that's the fact. Mm -hmm. To lawyers, the fact is what's in the published law books. Now, you can either have a bunch of humans memorize all the law books, or you can put it in a computer so you can ask it intelligent questions. How many times has this happened? Under what circumstance did this happen? What happened after this happened? Like you can start to ask it intelligent questions and react different to the information that comes out. But to automate the law process, you have to have a whole ton of facts that you then do something with. With cars, you had a ton of, we have figured out how to do it, and then we did it over and over and over. For building houses, building buildings, once you get it right, why, why can't a robot put the wall up? Yeah. And probably do it with more precision than the human and never sleep. I would rather the humans focus their ingenuity on what kind of new material should we use not stacking things on top of each other. Agreed. And when we create an object that will be automated, when we do the same thing a hundred million times, we'll do that. The thing that's most important and the people that I deal with all the time, um, how do we make sure that what the automation is doing, call it the robot, call it the automation, call it the AI, is operating on a hundred percent guaranteed fact base, truth. Is math true? Generally, people say, yeah. Is what's in the law books true? Okay. Is medicine true? Well. Only only to the level of what the not, the data is at present time. Yeah. So, like, there is a, you know, general scope of medicine that's accepted by the Board of yeah, yeah. Medicine, right? They wrote that in a book, and this is the today what is the acceptable course of treatment. So, it's the fact base. But things work for other people. So like, do you have a medical AI that tells you how to get better? Well, it can say, well, 70% of the people who did this, did, did, did. so there's a different set of fact and truth. It is true that a car goes down the road when you plug a tire on a thing and it goes, like that's fact. But when you start talking about something that's subjective, it's really hard to do AI on it because you can convince the AI to say really weird things. Yeah. Do you stop at a stop sign? That's the generally accepted practice. Do people in Phoenix ever follow the speed limit? <laughs> That's generally accepted practice to not. So what does the robot do? Do what the people do or do what the sign says? Is it fact? Is the speed limit fact? Yep. Should it go the speed limit? It better not. It will cause lots of accidents in yeah. Arizona. So, you know, this is what yeah, we debate. That's like, very, how do you game it to do the wrong thing? This is a really critical question. We can't agree very much what a fact is. Is it fact that we're in this room? Yes. Is it fact uh, that people will interpret what we've said differently? Absolutely. That's a fact, but now they have an opinion on top of what they True. think is the fact. And then we have out of context and man, when you automate something and you want it to be 100% accurate, good luck getting to 100. And a lot of people want something to be guaranteed in the computer world. It's either on or off or it's true or false. That's how computers work. Yeah. Y you can't make a lot of things true or false guaranteed. Sometimes yeah. you can get close to 100%. Uh, other things can be way misinterpreted. 
and you can make information do whatever you want and there's that that joke right um a hundred percent of the people who have ever drank water will die therefore water could kill you <laughs> right or however that yeah, I know analogy you. goes right yeah. so like you can make information say what you want <laughs> so suddenly robots are like oh water's bad for you yeah because everybody will die who drank water okay that's a that's totally a fact but it's totally unusable and how do you code a robot to know the difference this is what we talk about in the community of computer people who i have to give people advice but then i have to say well look in the world around you and see if this is usable right now what so, um in the in the short time we have left because <laughs> excuse me we could talk for hours have. for audience sake yeah scott all these different um, th topics of discussion, but probably I would say uh, more so on the second half of our podcast. If people want to get more involved or know more or research more or get more entrenched into these topics, can you just give some recommendations through, again, a technologist lens of where to reach out? Like are there groups that are meeting in Phoenix or is it all online? Just, I, again, I want to pay it forward to try to give some because people, the, the sh I know people that are interested in all these topics are going, hey, here was here was a guy that li has lived in this world yeah. and the transformation. How do you tell people where to go well, to learn more? Yeah, I want to preface by saying, if you don't know the answer, no question is a dumb question. Right. Never feel scared to go ask somebody a question if you don't know. Very, Please very well don't stated. Go, I should know better by now, and I want to ask you. Throw that away. Yeah. Like, go ask. Yeah. Um, is this grandpa, grandma proof? <laughs> is this, yeah. Um, I believe that the website called meetup.org yeah. is one of the best. Oh. So for people who've never used Meetup, it's like people like me. I want to start a AI group. So I go on there and I post. I'm meeting at the VFW every Tuesday. AI group. Sign up here. Yeah. And you can show up. You can find everything from like yoga in the park to AI to blockchain. Every one of these topics has a meetup. So that's an easy one. And those are regular people trying to talk to other regular people. Right. Just so to that's learn. good. Yeah. It's very easy. Um, there's no reason you can't just talk to um, your local school system. If you're of the right age group, be like, how, how are you teaching? Every one of those teachers is part of a community who's doing education or training or STEM groups. Like they know that's who a the good organizers point. are. So those are easy ones. Um, it's going to sound like commercial, but ask ChatGPT. Yeah. Like for real, I don't know what a virus is. Enter. It will not judge you. It, that's true. Ask the internet the crazy questions you want answers to. And as much as people want to complain about it, if you go to Bing or Google or Duck, DuckDuckGo or ChatGPT and you ask it a normal question, what is this thing? They will all agree. It will be 99.99% probably true. Uh, it won't give you an opinion. It will just give you some fact stuff. And and that's how you can ask questions. Like, but at least it's a start. Yeah, yeah. I, I just you know built myself a bench out of scrap wood because I kept asking, what do I do with the, the acrylic? And it would tell me, and I said, I don't understand. So it, like I just kept asking and I didn't have to worry about being judged. Um, but I think maybe then separately is just ask your neighbors. Hey, have you ever, like, this is a social thing. If you don't know, speak up. Hey, I heard about this AI thing. Do you know anybody? This whole six yeah. degrees of separation thing. That's good. It's a thing, right? We met at the, the yeah. Venture Cafe because right. I was doing a thing and you showed up and you, I, I've seen you. You met like 80 people there over a, <laughs> the summer. Now you have one relationship with them and it's people you never knew before no. because yeah. you, you know, were extroverted enough to say hi. Um, so if you're just extroverted for 10 seconds to say, I don't understand, the the good of people probably will be like, oh, I know a guy. I'll introduce you to him. I, I, I love that. I'm glad you uh, wrapped it up with that because as as geeky as this is, it comes back to human interaction. It, it does. So, yeah. Well, I can't thank you enough, Scott, for coming on so again. 
uh, anyone wants to spy or because he'll have all <laughs> he'll have all the blockers on because you know he knows how to do that. But Scott at Savvy Advisors, and again, uh, I I still love the SaaS Scott as a service. Yeah. There's there's nothing better than that. Scott as a service is available uh, for services. He's a, he's in yeah because if he can't. If he doesn't do uh, well for you as an advisor, uh, that alone says he knows how to help. Uh, he really knows how to do marketing. So. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Scott. I really I appreciate, appreciate you coming Thank on. Thank you. Yeah, it's All been right. fun. You've been listening to the Mac and Blue Show, brought to you by Blue Wave General Contracting. Be sure to subscribe to the Mac and Blue podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Follow JJ Levensky on LinkedIn and Instagram. Tune in every Monday 